So I might as well explain what's going on here. This is that L77 I got from Bob, and I've had a hard time getting it to start without priming it. And so I started doing the normal things like put a diaphragm in there, check the fuel line. The fuel line looks fine. It's not that. And then I started kicking it over and realized that the switch, I was bumping the switch to off because it's rotated the wrong way. Now, the rotated the wrong way, I knew, so I had it turned on. But just the way, that, when it's pushed in like that, me grabbing a hold of the handle, I was actually shutting it off. So that created me some hassle. So in trying to get the switch off of there, I busted off that little little tab. And uh, also figured out that this little dam here, right here, was broken. And, add insult to injury, the bend on this choke lever, I don't believe actually got the choke on all the way. So I think I was dealing with multiple issues. So what I'm going to try to do now is I have, a, I have this L65 right here that I want to see if I can borrow this and this piece and see if that doesn't solve my problem. But then I'm going to have to go find, you know, some replacements. Um, if you look at that air filter, you go back in time and look at some of the saws that I worked on, you're going to find that this concept is kind of familiar to another brand. <laughs> uh, I won't go there. But basically, this series of Husqvarna is interesting. One of the things I learned in... Uh, when I was doing the research on these, and I guess I shouldn't be surprised, but the Husqvarna brand has been doing these vertical layout piston port designs since the 60s. Not the 70s, the 1960s. Late 50s even. And I guess I haven't found another brand that had that piston port layout any earlier. I'm sure they're out there, I just don't know of any. And the reason why I shouldn't be surprised is, is this is the same group of people at the time who were building the race bikes, which were all piston port designs. So it's a technology that they had been familiar with, you know. But I find it interesting because even John's friend, one of the brands that I, th I thought was very, very innovative, and they are, there's no doubt that they were. They didn't get into the piston port stuff um, until the mid-60s, you know? So, as much as I would like to give them credit, because I happen to like the John's Fred brand, the Husqvarna people were there before them with that layout. Just a point of interest. is about no I guess it's a little older that's probably from the 50s maybe 60s that's from the 1970s I like these old trailers like this for the woods work for you guys who do this type of thing first of all you can usually get them at an auction for a couple hundred bucks but the large diameter tires they have you know roll over logs and bumps and rocks and stuff better so it's easier for me to get that thing through the woods loaded especially when it's muddy out but this morning's operation I gotta split some stuff here right and then maybe we'll fire up that L77 Husqvarna so yep I've got a bunch of saws in the truck I've got everything from a 32 inch bar to an 18 that one there's about an 18 and it's bad enough to handle the noodling on these, so. But I want to run my old vintage saws. I may fit that saw with a 24, but right now that old tilting bar with a 
with the uh, six riveted tip. Man, that thing's a solid old bar. And I've, I used it last fall, you know, it's an old man, right? Did some felling with it and uh, it didn't have any problems with the kind of bore cutting I was doing into the hardwood. I got some video of that, you know. I got another one of these that was given to me by a friend who's also a subscriber. It's a Yugoslavian version. And uh, I want to get both those saws running pretty good. That's the plan. And then spend a little bit more time with those. You know, I like the Homolites, and I like the old Huskies, and I like the old John Threads. You know, everyone has their, their uh, chosen brands. Those are mine. And I think it's interesting that, like the old steels, there's a couple of old steels that have that vertical layout, piston port. And then Husqvarna did as well in the 60s into the 70s, but they kind of pioneered the two companies. In my mind, kind of pioneered the layout that pretty much lasted until today. And then a bunch of the other major companies of the time didn't survive, McCulloch and Homelite, for a variety of reasons. Part of it's because the type of saws they were building at the time were just too expensive to, to build and compete with these more simple designs from Husqvarna. And I guess still at some level. So let's see if we can get this thing fired up. And then uh, get that axe fired up if I can't get that fired up. Just want to finish off this. continue with this saw right here and let me see if I can get restarted I filled it up with fuel and oil he used probably a quarter tank so I just really topped it off maybe a half I had a little time on it before so it may not be fuel efficient but the one thing I can tell you it's gonna run out of gas about the same time I do because of how much it vibrates it's a it's a lunk of steel here well aluminum does vibrate, but I'll tell you what, it makes good power. This thing is not lacking in horsepower. Let's see if it'll start.
Well, we'll see if it works. I cut a bar down. And I put another slot right there for the adjuster for the bar oil. And I cut the back off as much as I could and I moved the slot forward as much as I could. Now, I always worry about that because is the chain going to feed onto that now? Yeah, partly because the diameter of the sprocket needs to be a little bit larger in order to feed on it, you know, cleanly. The problem is, Hilton uh, was trying to be different. So instead of having an 18 or 20 inch bar with a standard, you know, like everybody else in the planet, uh, 68 or 72, they came up with a bar that was right smack in the middle that needed 70 lengths. And I don't have any 70 lengths, and I don't like 58 chain. And it's not that I don't like it, I just don't keep it around. So, I may have come up with a spacer. A little more slop than I like. And we'll just see what it does. couple of wires in there just wrap it with wire anyway let me work on that so I took a nail and I put it on the grinder and, and ground it kind of flat and then uh, made a short of, sort of an S shape with it so I'm kind of curious to see if that does the trick just a little Chainsaw trivia right here. These are some bones that I have that I want to turn into working saws. And L65 has got compression but no spark. L77 Yugoslavian version. I've got a true L77 you've seen on the channel quite a bit. And this is a 480. Check out that handle. And uh, one of the interesting things is from the A77 through to the 480, the cylinder is about the same. Bore and stroke, displacement, casting, everything. So these were like late 60s in the case of the A77 through the 70s. So from the A77 through to the 480s they use this basic cylinder right here you know really simple stuff and uh, this one's going to go on one of the saws it's in really nice shape don't know which one familiar looking shape to the intake right you know kind of small transfers I mean it was designed to run at quite a bit lower RPM than some of the modern saws. So those obviously are not going to be as big as, as a current saw. Let's do a comparison. See these are roughly 80 cc's or 77 cc's. And look at the size of the transfers versus a mid 90s 372 design which it's designed to run quite a bit higher RPMs, right? Quad port and larger transfers so those guys were were torque monsters you know and then based on the casting obviously you're not gonna do much unless you do finger ports if you want to raise the RPMs on how these things run but to my uh, way of thinking why do that why not just enjoy them as they are you know they're great old saws they run good and if you look at some of the more modern designs, maybe the size of the transfers isn't everything, is it? This is off a 576. Right? Boy, that's something for you guys to think about. Those transfers out the front, picking up all that heat. What are they doing? What are they doing? 
So another interesting thing about this series of saw is there's a lot of stuff still available. And if you look at the cranks, they have that half 13 thread. Of course, I've got a puller for those. But look at that. 6202 C3 bearing, just like on a 372. Steel caged. Nice looking part. Look at that. It's a nice looking crank. And that'll be an M10 by 1, I believe. Nice looking piston. So this top end's going on something. I don't know which one. Very nice part. You know who you are. So let me protect that gasket. Now there's really two things that are going to limit the RPMs on this class of saw. One obviously is the transfer ports and the second thing is the ignition because it's a point style ignition. And now you have the dynamics of having that that little points arm bouncing back around. There's physical limits on how fast that thing can actually do something, you know. There again, you can see the coarse thread on the crank. Now you see that same thread on some of the early, like 61s and saws in that class, you know, that came after these, the 60 and 70 cc, 61 through 272 class saws. And uh, of course these also had oil pumps. And you can see they have a the worm gear right there drive the oil pump. So this was an early design that had automatic oiling. I mean Husqvarna in my mind were way 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 ahead of their time in terms of both the power but also the weight but also things like the features related to the you know oil pump and the way the clutch operated carburetors you know controls ergonomics something that you're familiar with. Choke here. Of course there's a kill switch versus an on off on this one. But uh, here's a 570 which would be like a 575. Look at the size difference. That's a much larger frame than this one right here. Just a bigger saw. Of course the 372 is bigger than this as well physically. And I'm telling you what, these things for practical power are not that far off, say a 365, 372 class stock saw. They run at a lot lower RPMs, as you can tell with the with the cylinders design, but they make a lot of power. They run good. You know, in my humble opinion, they were ahead of John Thread in the sense that they were that same kind of power but lighter. They're way ahead of the steel. And they're way, way, way ahead of the Mac and the Homolites, the McCulloughs and the Homolites, in terms of just power to weight ratio. You don't have to deal with reed valves and the complexity of that. You know, the layout that these guys had then has pretty much transcended into what we have today. You know, just good stuff. I'm a little surprised that the vintage community hasn't discovered these yet. Now, I had one up in the video a few years back where I was, well, actually, it was just last year I used one in production work um, when I was logging just simply because it was a good enough running saw to do that. You know, I like to wrap my vintage saws in when I can. And uh, it's really easy to wrap in the L77 because it's just not that far off. Same with my 61 to 272 saw. It's easy to wrap that into my operations just simply because it's not that far off a modern saw. You know, that's the magic of these old husk furnace. So, anyway, trivia.